Hello, everybody. This is Chuck Carnival, co-founder of FastGraphs, the fundamentals analyzer software tool, also known as Mr. Valuation. Once again, it's my great pleasure to invite you and welcome you to another Subscriber Request Tuesday video. Uh, in this particular video, I'm going to cover a dividend king by the name of Leggett and Platt. I've been asked to cover this stock several times, but I'll show you here when I get into the video. I've refrained from covering it because I felt the stock was overvalued. But one of the lessons that I learned many years ago is that if you wait long enough, you'll be able to buy even the best of stocks at attractive valuations because ultimately stocks always are moving towards their intrinsic value. They get disconnected from that at times, and those are times you want to avoid buying the stock. But when you can buy a great dividend king like Leggett and Platt that's increased its dividend for more than 50 years in a row, which makes it a dividend king, that might be something you want to look at, but I also want to give you some real good insights into what the nature of the beast is, so to speak. So, you know, when you're looking at a stock like Leggett and Platt, which is a dividend king, you understand clearly what you're investing in and what your potential might be. So that's one of the things that I think is very important. So let's go ahead and look at the stock. And I'm going back here to, to, to 2001. And the first thing I want to point out about this company is that if I get rid of price and get rid of the normal valuation... I want you to notice there's a lot of cyclicality in this company. It's been very cyclical historically over the years. Okay, so that's one of the first things that I think you need to be focused on. You can see the earnings, which are plotted by this orange line, have grown at about 4.09% per annum, but it's been erratic. There are times when, you know, in the recession of 01, the earnings fell, and, you know, the, the earnings fell during the Great Recession for three years in a row here, and then we saw some decent growth. But something that you need to be aware of when you're looking at this, and this is where research and due diligence comes into play. In 2007, this company embarked on a, what they called a two-year strategic plan. The first part of the strategy was to divest themselves from underperforming businesses or businesses that weren't giving them the returns that they felt you know they should get. And then they started to make several acquisitions, and they've made a couple even this past year, to, so that they could boost growth, because that was their objective. So if I shorten this time frame, you know, past 2007, if you will, you can see that their growth rate has accelerated to over 9%. Okay, it's almost doubled. And of course, they had a little hiccup during COVID like everyone else did. That's your COVID recession here, marked in gray on the fast graphs. But the other thing to focus on is the dividend. They did go through a period of time for a couple of years coming out of the Great Recession where their dividend payout ratio actually exceeded 100%. You know, you can see that by looking at the white line here. It got up to 113% in 08, and it was similar to that in 09. It's hard for me to hit it there because it's in that white line area. But that was just temporary, and then the company's been growing ever since. Now, here's the thing. This is the nature of this beast. Okay, it had very flat earnings growth over the first years here up through 2007. So if I take my scroll bar here and use this to analyze what the company looked like back then, you can see it actually had negative earnings growth. You know, of course, that's going through 2007. So to be fair to them, and that was in the throes of the recession, I'll take a couple of more years off of there just to point out that there wasn't a lot of growth, about 2.5% growth going on in the company. And then again, they divested some non-performing or, or low margin businesses, and they started to invest in better margin businesses. And as I showed you a minute ago, their growth rates accelerated. Now, what you really get a good perspective is when you bring the weekly closing stock prices into the graph. Now, I'm not going to put the market PE line on here yet. It's that, there it is, the blue line. I want you to just look at it from the perspective of what I call the intrinsic value line or the orange line, which is a 15 PE ratio, which is quite normal for stocks. And, you know, we're doing the Value U Academy. We just did a video on this. You might want to go check out our Fast Grass Value U Academy videos. We'll be launching another one tomorrow. We've got a couple already launched that you can start looking at. And we've got a workbook that goes along with that. So take a look at that if you haven't already. But I want you to basically get the impression here when you're looking at this graph, when the price is above the orange line, that connotates periods of excessive valuation. When the price is touching the line, that represents good valuation. But keep in mind, good valuation, and we talk about this in the Academy video, also has to be looked at in the context of growth. Because here, you had three or four years of really nice valuation on Leggett and Platt, but it was a very poor investment 
because the company was doing poorly during this period of time. You can see that even though it was fairly valued this whole time, you'd have lost about 9% on average of your money. Having this perspective and the ability to analyze the business along with the stock price is one of the great benefits of fast graph. But I also want you to note how often the stock reverts back to this mean, to gets back to the intrinsic value, it gets overvalued, it comes back. And clearly, periods of high valuation are not when you want to be investing in a company. You want to basically try to find a company when it's trading at at least at fair value, but preferably when it begins to get undervalued. Now, Leggett and Platt, it got caught up in the flash crash. The price dropped dramatically, as you can see, during COVID. But then it recovered very, very strongly and got overvalued. And this is what I referred to earlier. I wasn't really interested in doing a video on the stock when its valuation was what I considered to be excessive. But as you can see now, the stock has underperformed price-wise this year, but yet they're having one of the best operating years they've ever had. They're going to have some double-digit operating years going forward, it looks like. So now would be the time to begin interested in Leggett and Platt. Now, because this is a dividend king, and it's increased its dividend for 50 years, the market has had a penchant to apply about an 18 multiple on average over this 20 years. So if you use that as your valuation reference, now we've got a really nice margin of safety built into the stock. But even if you're more conservative and use the 15 PE, the stock currently trades at a blended PE of 13.9, we'll call it 14, offers almost a 4.5% dividend yield, a very attractive earnings yield in excess of 7%, and 50 consecutive years of increasing their dividend. I think that's really a critical point here, that this company is you know, a dividend king. And they just raised their dividend by 5% in the third quarter from $0.40 cents a share to $0.42 cents a share. That was in the third quarter, 2020. And that was their 50th year of consecutive annual dividend increases, which again, now makes it a dividend king as well as a dividend aristocrat which is companies have increased their dividend for 25 years. But I also want to point out this investment is really all about the dividend income as a result. That's the real strength of investing in Leggett and Platt because you can see performance-wise, the performance hasn't been great. Now, the company started in, in this time frame I'm looking at here, which was the beginning of 01, at fair value. I want you to note that. Okay, so if I, you know, you'd have bought the stock back then and held it through yesterday's close, you would have, earned about 5.5%, which is very consistent with the company's growth, which was also very cyclical, plus a little dividend income. You only got 3% annualized capital appreciation, and the rest of the money came from dividends. But the dividends were the story, and I think that's really important. So let's look at that from a different perspective. Let's look at it from the standpoint of the dividend has grown on average at about 6.7% average compound growth rate has been 654 that's, you know, going back to 2001, and you can see the income has increased, you know, year after year after year. On a $10,000 investment, it generated more than twice as much income as an index would have, but less growth potential. It only averaged about 20% growth. But keep in mind, the S&P 500 is also a index that I would argue is significantly overvalued. And let's look at that very, very quickly here, just so you get that perspective. You know, I always say measuring performance without measuring valuation is a job half done. The market is excessively overvalued. I believe the S&P 500 ought to be trading at or somewhere around 2,800 and it's trading at 4,500. So when you look at it from that perspective, Leggett is at a big disadvantage because even though it was overvalued or, you know, giving a similar multiple to the market in April of this year, it has now subsequently come back down into attractive valuation. But also keep in mind that the fact that the company has been divesting underperforming businesses and making acquisitions to accelerate its growth going forward. Now, its analyst scorecard is good, but not great, okay? On a one-year forward estimate, analysts have been wrong about 33% of the time with a 10% margin of error, and they've been wrong about 25% of the time with a 20% margin of error. And COVID and COVID-related was part of it, and some of the supply chain restraints have been causing that. Now, you know, if you're not really familiar with who Leggett is, they are headquartered in Carthage, Missouri. Okay, they're a global manufacturer. This is according to Zach's Investment Research now. 
that conceives, designs, and produces a wide variety of engineered components and products found in homes, offices, and automobiles. Their product line includes components for bedding, automotive, seal, and lumber systems, specialty bedding foams and private label, finished mattresses, residential, as well as office furniture, flooring, underlayment, adjustable beds, bedding industry, machinery, etc. Bedding products account for, last year, counted for almost 48% of their total revenues. Specialized products, about 21%, and I'm using round numbers here, and then furniture, flooring, and textiles, about 31%. So, you know, bedding is still their big business. And again, the stock has become reasonably priced. Looking at forward potential, analysts are expecting double-digit growth this year at over 28%. And that makes the stock undervalued based on a growth rate of 16.5. I'm using a PE here of 16.5. That would mean that Leggett and Platt offers really substantial returns over the next couple of years on a total return basis and a 4.42 or if we'll call it a 4.5% dividend yield on top of that. So it's also got great income potential. If you looked at it from the normal multiple, about 18 or 19, the numbers are even better. So, you know, the fact that the company has got some good growth ahead of it and it's come down into attractive valuation with a very strong dividend yield makes this a very attractive investment currently. So you might want to take a close look at Leggett and Platt. Now, some of the you know points that I made earlier, their long-term strategic plan, according to Zach's investment research, is on track, You know where they're divesting underperforming businesses and then moving into better growth initiatives. They made acquisitions during the second quarter. They acquired two businesses last year. They acquired a company called KFO, which was a leading provider of specialty foam and finished mattresses. And then on their largest acquisition was ECS. The company is, you know, gaining critical capabilities, according to Zach's, in proprietary foam technology, as well as scale in the production of private label finished mattresses. So, you know, the, the company is attempting to position themselves for long-term growth. But the key message I want to get across here is, this was an overvalued stock and it became fairly valued. And I want you to, again, focus on how the, the business is what ultimately generates the return. And the whole essence of value investing is to participate, is to invest in a stock at a valuation that allows you to participate fully in the growth of the business. And in this case, the dividend income that the business is capable of producing. OK, now, one of the things that we've been doing in the past is going through what we call right now a financial or fiscal health check. And I do want to make an announcement. We're going to be formalizing this. Right now, we've got a placeholder here called performance. This will eventually be the fiscal health check and where premium subscribers of FastGraph will be able to go in and go through this exercise of simply checking the fiscal health of the company through some metrics. And I'm working with the academics that I've got, my professors, Nathan Mock and Bill Kay, and as well as my son Colton and I and, and Tim Loudon, our head developer, are going to be working on major improvements to the fund graph. So that's something for all you who are subscribers to look forward to. But let's start with the health check. And the health check is the first thing I like to look at are share buybacks that are valuation based. Now, if you look at Leggett and Platt, I, I went back here to 2007 and so on. When I say valuation based, I want to see buybacks when the company is trading at an attractive valuation. Well, in Leggett and Platt's case, they've really not bought too many shares back, but they are committed. They just announced that they're really going to commit to raising capital or having capital to do share buybacks, as well as, you know, keep increasing the dividend, which, as I pointed out earlier, has increased by over 50 years. So they get a check mark or a plus on share buybacks that are valuation based. The next thing I like to do is I like to go into the in millions graph here and I'm going to close out this. And again, we're going to have this preset where all you got to do is click on it. And now what I want to look at is I want to look at net income on the income statement. And then I want to look at net operating cash flow from the cash flow statement. And what I want to see is I want to see cash flow from operations or net operating cash flow higher than net income. And there's a cyclical nature to this stock. You can see that this isn't the greatest picture. It's higher for sure. I do have cash flow from operations higher than net income, but at times it gets close and it's not real consistent. I prefer to see things much more consistent than that, but it essentially gets a pass here. Then the next thing I like to see is I want to then take a look at the sales growth trend. 
All right, so what I'm going to do then is go into the income statement and look at sales growth. And once again, I've got growth, especially if you go back, you know, and shorten this time frame past the Great Recession, okay? We're starting to see that sales growth has, you know, begun to accelerate. But it's, again, it's not consistent every year that, you know, in 2016, sales actually dropped. But the company is hopefully improving that. I like to look at this at least a three to five year minimum. And, you know, this is COVID related, which I'm going to give them a pass on COVID because that's really, you know, something that virtually every company went through. And then the next thing I want to look at is then net income growth. How's net income growth look over the last three to five years? And here I've got a little bit of an issue with net income being down in 2020. So, you know, that's another thing that I'm a little bit concerned with. They're generating net income, but the growth hasn't been great. I want to see a debt to equity ratio that is, you know, decent. What I'm really looking for here is I want to see total equity. So I'm going to go into the balance sheet and I want to see total equity compared to total debt. Okay. And, you know, I want to see equity higher than debt. And once again, I'm not real happy with what I see with Leggett and Platt. But again, the company just made some major acquisitions. I think that's one reason why you're seeing that the company's debt has, you know, ballooned in 2019 and 2020. So, you know, hopefully that with the cash flows, they'll be able to get rid of that. From a margin point of view, the company has been working real hard to improve their margin. So, if I go and I look at gross and net margin, I'm pretty pleased with what I see here. The company generates, you know, gross margins in the 20% range and a net margins in the 7 to 8% range. They were a little lower than that in 2020, but again, the company made some acquisitions. Asset turnover, which is interesting, I'm going to go and look at the income statement here. I'm going to look at sales revenue, and then I'm going to look at total assets on the balance sheet. And what I want to see here is I do want to see a decent amount of asset turn. They're not really turning over their assets really well. Again, that's a kind of a, it's not a negative in this case, but it's not a real strong plus either. Then I want to see returns on assets. So I'm going to go back into the ratio graphs and I'm going to look at the profitability ratios and I'm going to look at returns on assets. I like to see the return on asset of 10% or better. They fall a little bit short there, but they're close. Some years they actually do exceed it. So I'd like to see a little better, you know, efficiency return on equity. I'd like to see it 15% or better. And again, I don't really get that. That's return on capital employed return on equity. I don't quite get there, but I get pretty close in some years. And some years they do exceed a return on equity of 15% or better. But last year, 2020, it was only 9%, but they did make some acquisitions. And then I want to see, you know, EBIT margin or operating earnings margin, which is EBIT divided by sales. So once again, I'm going to go into the income statement. Let me get rid of this. I'm going to go into the income statement and I'm going to look at sales revenue. And then I'm going to look at EBIT operating income. And I'm going to get rid of total assets here just to clean up the picture. And this looks, you know, pretty good here. They've got really pretty high operating margin, which I do kind of like. So all in all, the fiscal health check for the company is good, but it's not great. Now, a couple other things I want to do real quickly. I want to go through some of the other metrics with you. When I look at, you know, basic and diluted earnings, um, you can see, you know, a difference in diluted earnings versus operating earnings, which, you know, it's close, but it's different. Operating cash flow covering the dividend is very strongly covering the dividend. I'll even take the price off of here. Operating cash flow is a little bit cyclical, but it's generally been higher than the dividend income. The all-important free cash flow did drop down quite a bit in COVID, and it was weak in 2010-11, but it's expected to improve. So, you know, again, it's a, it is a dividend king that's, you know, paid their dividend, uh, increased their dividend for, for 50 consecutive years now. EBITDA, which is another form of cash flow, looks very consistent and very strong. And EBIT looks very consistent and very strong, notwithstanding what happened to COVID, especially, again, if you just look at more recent years where the company's been executing 
their uh, you know new plan to kind of get themselves into a more of a growth phase than they've been. Now, some of the negatives that you want to be concerned about the company, like many companies, is facing some supply constraints, and that's you know that's pretty much universal across a lot of industries. They're having trouble with you know keeping a competitive workforce. But again, that's out there. Hopefully, all of that is temporary for most businesses. But, you know, otherwise, this this is a really excellent company. But I think you want to be realistic in what you can expect it to do. So, you know, going into operating earnings here and looking at forecasting, I've got good growth going forward. I got double digit rates of return. I think Leggett and Platt looks real attractive here after coming down from being overvalued just, you know, just just a few months ago back in May. It would have been I would have told you not to, but you could see it's been and a steady downtrend. This is the time, ladies and gentlemen, to be looking at buying a stock. You want to be greedy when others are fearful and fearful when others are greedy. Now, I want to wait until the company gets far enough below the orange line and then the normal multiple line as well so that I have a margin of safety. The bigger, the better. So I could either start building a position here or even aggressively build a position here because I really do like the 4.4% dividend. The dividend has grown at around 6 or 8% a year. It'd be very quickly, you'll be averaging over 5% in growing on the dividend. So anyway, that's Leggett and Platt, very interesting company. It is a dividend king. They've increased their dividend for 50 consecutive years. The company's improving their business um, quite dramatically here, as I pointed out several times. Growth is you know, getting back up into the 8 and 9% range. The question is, can they continue to execute and will they? But the other side of this whole story is it's a story of valuation. You can see the valuations got very interesting. Anyway, this has been Chuck Carmel saying thanks for watching. I do want to announce that I'm going to take what I believe is a well-deserved vacation and spend some time with my family over the uh, Christmas holidays. And so I want to take this chance to wish all of you a very, very Merry Christmas and a Happy Holiday, whichever is appropriate. But even more importantly, I want to, I'm looking forward to a prosperous, healthy um, new year coming up here. I think there's a lot of opportunity. Fast Graphs has got a lot of things going on. For those of you who are subscribers, the Value Academy is getting into full swing. So I'm getting a little rest here because I want to come out in 2022, you know, full of energy and uh, really try to take this to the next level and help you all be better investors, uh, even, you know, better than we've been doing that for you so far with Fast Graphs. So everyone have a, you know, thanks for a great year. Happy holidays. And let's uh, look forward to a good New Year's next year. If you like this video, give me a like, ring the bell, subscribe to the channel if you haven't. We appreciate y'all. And again, everyone have a happy holidays. Thanks for watching.